For 2,000 years, it slept in darkness. A tomb of splintered wood and shattered marble, 43 meters beneath the waves of the Aegean Sea. When it was finally brought into the light, it looked like nothing. A lump of bronze and rock, calcified and corroded. A piece of debris that broke into fragments the moment it touched the air. It was dismissed. Ignored. A footnote in a long list of priceless statues and jewellery recovered from a Roman shipwreck. Its unassuming appearance was a perfect disguise. The first archaeological reports focused on magnificent bronze and marble statues, fine glassware and gold jewellery scattered across the wreck. The corroded lump was considered nothing more than debris unworthy of special attention. But inside that lump, a secret was waiting. A universe of interlocking gears, with a level of miniaturization and precision comparable to an 18th century clock. A ghost of a machine. A machine that should not exist. This is the story of the Antikythera mechanism, the world's first known analog computer, conceived a century before the birth of Christ. An object so advanced that its very existence defies the conventional story of human history. This single artifact forces us to question what we think we know about the ancient world, suggesting a depth of mechanical and astronomical knowledge that should not have appeared for another millennium and a half. It is the story of its violent discovery, the half-century quest to unlock its code, and the haunting mystery of how a civilization capable of building the cosmos in a box could vanish taking its genius with it. Our story begins not in a library, but in the unforgiving sea. It is Easter, 1900. Captain Dimitrios Kontos and his crew of sponge divers sail from their home on the island of Simi, bound for the rich fishing grounds of North Africa. But between Crete and the Greek mainland, in a channel infamous for its treachery, the Aegean Sea shows its teeth. A sudden, violent Meltemi wind descends a squall that rises without warning. With his ships and crew in peril, Kontos has no choice but to seek shelter in a small bay off the barren rocky island of Antikythera. This act of desperation, a flight from the storm's fury, will lead to the single greatest archaeological discovery of the 20th century. Hey everyone, Josh here. Thanks for stopping by again, and if you're new, welcome aboard. I'm an independent creator, chasing the forgotten echoes of our world's history, the stories time tried to erase and bringing them back to light. If you enjoy uncovering these hidden chapters with me, don't forget to subscribe, like, and share this video. Your support is what keeps these journeys alive. Now, let's step back into the past. When the storm finally passes after three days, the crew decides to test the waters of the bay for sponges. A diver named Elias Stadiatos is the first to go down. He surfaces moments later, frantic tearing off his heavy copper helmet, gasping about a nightmare on the seafloor. A heap of dead, naked women. Captain Kontos assumes he has lost his senses to nitrogen narcosis, the rapture of the deep. He suits up and dives himself, but what he finds is not death, it is treasure. The dead women are statues, bronze and marble figures scattered across the remains of an ancient Roman ship sunk two millennia ago. The luck of this encounter is staggering. A storm forced them to an unplanned bay. A single dive placed them directly over a wreck that had lain untouched since the first century before Christ. The discovery electrifies Greece, a nation still smarting from its defeat in the Greco-Turkish War just three years earlier it becomes a matter of national pride. The government hires Kontos and his crew to salvage the wreck. For nearly a year, from November of 1900 to September of 1901, they brave winter storms and the crushing depths of over 40 meters. The work is brutal. They have only one diving suit and helmet, forcing them to take turns in 10-minute shifts. The toll is heavy. Two men are permanently crippled by decompression sickness, Another, Georgios Kritikos, loses his life in service to the past. And among the last of the treasures brought up are a few green, corroded lumps of bronze. No one knows it yet, but this ugly, unassuming find recovered at such a terrible human cost will become the most important artifact of them all. In the grand halls of the National Archaeological Museum in Athens, the statues were celebrated. 
the jewellery admired. The magnificent bronze youth, perhaps Perseus, became a national icon, but the corroded fragments were forgotten. They were simply wreckage from the wreck, stored away on a dusty shelf among lesser finds. Two years pass. Then, on May 17, 1902, archaeologist Valerios Stais notices something impossible. Through the calcified crust of one lump, a perfect circle. The unmistakable teeth of a gear, and beside it, faint but legible, an inscription in ancient Greek. He realizes this is not debris. It is a machine. He proposes a radical idea. Perhaps it is an astronomical clock. But his colleagues are not convinced. They are outraged. The wreck dates to the first century before Christ. Complex geared machinery should not exist for another 14 centuries. To the academic world of the time, such sophistication was unthinkable. It violated the sacred story of linear progress, the belief that technology advanced in a straight, orderly line. They called it an astrolabe. Some even claimed it was a modern device that had fallen into the sea and contaminated the site. The idea that ancient Greeks could build such a machine was dismissed. The debate faded. The mechanism was forgotten once more. And for 50 years, its secret remained locked inside. The story might have ended there, but in 1951, a new figure enters Derek de Sola Price, a British physicist and historian of science from Yale University. He had studied ancient timekeeping devices and written his doctoral thesis on a medieval astronomical calculator. When he first saw photographs of the Antikythera fragments, he sensed that the world had overlooked something monumental. For more than 20 years, Price dedicated himself to the puzzle. He examined every available image and in 1958 travelled to Athens to see the pieces with his own eyes. But the truth was hidden beneath layers of corrosion that no human eye could penetrate. He needed to see through time itself. In the early 1970s, he finally could. Using high-powered X-rays and gamma radiography, Price peered into the artifact's heart using the power of the atom to reveal the genius of the ancient craftsman. The images that emerged were breathtaking. Beneath the crust lay not one gear, but a symphony of them. At least 30 precision-cut bronze wheels meshed in intricate harmony. Price painstakingly counted the teeth, traced their alignments, and slowly, the purpose of the device came to life. It had once been housed in a wooden box about 30 centimetres high and 15 centimetres wide, compact, elegant, and astonishingly complex. In June of 1959, before the research was even complete, Price announced his conclusion in the pages of Scientific American. This was not a clock. It was an analog computer, a mechanical calculator that predicted the movements of the heavens. And within it was a component thought to be born over 1600 years later, a differential gear. It could add or subtract rates of motion. A cornerstone of modern engineering, Already alive in bronze centuries before Christ, Price realized the implications were earth-shattering. He wrote that the mechanism gives the lie to a theory long outworn that the ancients, reliant on slaves, lacked sophisticated technology. This single object rewrote history. So what did the Antikythera mechanism actually do? Decades of work by Price, Michael Wright, and the International Antikythera Mechanism Research Project would finally reveal it. Imagine you are a Greek scholar in 100 before Christ. This is your cosmos in a box. On the front, pointers for the sun and moon move across two concentric dials, the inner ring marking the 12 signs of the zodiac, the outer ring tracking the 365 days of the Egyptian calendar. Other pointers, now lost, once showed the positions of the five planets known to the Greeks, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn and a small sphere, half white and half black, rotated to display the phases of the moon. But the true genius lay on the back. Two spiralled dials tracked the great cycles of time. The upper one followed the 19-year metonic cycle, the perfect synchronization of the sun and moon. The lower one tracked the Saros cycle, 223 lunar months, about 18 years predicting eclipses with stunning accuracy. 
Nested within these cosmic spirals was something beautifully human, a small subsidiary dial marking the four-year cycle of the Panhellenic Games, the Olympic, Pythian, Isthmian, and Nemean contests. To its maker, the Games were as fixed in the rhythm of time as an eclipse of the Sunday. Deep within, the mechanism contained one final masterpiece. The ancient astronomers, like Hipparchus, knew the Moon's orbit was not a perfect circle, it sped up and slowed down. To reproduce this first anomaly, the craftsman built something never described in any surviving ancient text, a pin and slot mechanism. One gear carried a small pin that slid through a slot on another, offset gear, forcing it to accelerate and decelerate perfectly mimicking the moon's motion in the sky. A work of pure mechanical genius, 15 centuries ahead of its rediscovery. In the 21st century, High-resolution scans of the surviving fragments revealed thousands of microscopic Greek characters, some less than a millimetre tall, carved onto every available surface. They were instructions, a user manual. It confirmed the astronomical purpose of the device, but added something unexpected. The eclipse predictions came with astrological notes describing the colour of the eclipse and the winds that would blow. To the Greeks, the cosmos was not just a machine to be observed, but a living text to be read for omens. Astronomy, astrology and meteorology were one and the same. This was not merely a calculator. It was a model of the universe, a physical embodiment of Greek cosmology. A machine this perfect could not have been a first draft. It must have come from a long tradition. And that tradition leads back to one man Archimedes of Syracuse. Over a century before the Antikythera mechanism was built, Archimedes was said to have constructed devices that modelled the motions of the sun, moon and planets. Cicero described one such sphere, captured by the Romans after the fall of Syracuse in 212 before Christ. He wrote that when a Roman general turned the globe, the moon followed the sun's path exactly as in the sky proof of a mechanical cosmos built by human hands. These writings confirm that the Antikythera mechanism was not an isolated miracle, but the last descendant of a lost lineage, the school of Archimedes himself. The clues on the device point to the island of Rhodes. Its star calendar matches a latitude of about 35 degrees, perfect for Rhodes, and too far north or south for anywhere else. Its games dial mentions the Haliaea, a local festival of Helios, the sun god. In the second and first centuries before Christ, Rhodes was a centre of astronomy and mechanical engineering, home to Hipparchus and Posidonius, both described as builders of cosmic models. The evidence suggests that the Antikythera mechanism was crafted in a Rhodian workshop where Babylonian data, Greek geometry and unparalleled mechanical artistry met. And then, it all vanished. If the ancient Greeks could build this, why did it disappear? Why did it take 1400 years before anything like it reappeared in medieval Europe? Perhaps such devices were always rare, the treasures of a small intellectual elite. Perhaps their makers guarded their knowledge as family secrets. Or perhaps the answer lies in the metal itself. Bronze was precious. When a device broke, it was melted down, recycled into swords, coins or statues. The knowledge perished with the material. Or maybe the world simply changed. The theoretical curiosity of the Greeks gave way to the pragmatic engineering of the Romans. The questions shifted from how does the cosmos work to how do we build an aqueduct? The fragile blend of philosophy and craftsmanship that made the Antikythera mechanism possible vanished. And so, in a final irony, the sea that destroyed the ship preserved its greatest treasure. The depths protected it from the furnaces of history. The true shipwreck was not the one on the seafloor. The true shipwreck was the loss of knowledge on land. The Antikythera mechanism is more than an artefact. It is a ghost, an echo of a future that could have been. It reminds us that progress is not a straight line, and that sometimes the most brilliant ideas lie forgotten, waiting patiently in the dark for us to find them again. Thank you for joining me on this journey. The past is a vast archive, silent, waiting, and every story we uncover brings us closer to understanding who we are. So, what should we explore next? Tell me in the comments below, 
Until next time, stay curious and keep questioning. <laughs>